Top questions to ask before you do IVF. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor. And today we're talking all about my top tips for you if you are starting or about to start IVF and I want you to be prepared. When you go through IVF, I know it can be really overwhelming and sometimes we just want to blindly trust and proceed. And for a lot of people that works out. However, I will always say that IVF is running a marathon and the more prepared you are, the better you train, the better, the easier the process will be because we ultimately can't control your entire outcome, but we can control your experience and your education, your knowledge, and that you understand the choices that are being made why they are being made, and how to advocate for yourself the best. So we are going to briefly go over very quickly IVF in a quick, quick nutshell, and then my top questions that you should be asking of your care team before starting the process. So when you do IVF, what we're trying to do is get one month's group of eggs all to grow. The way I always like to explain this is if you imagine inside your ovary is a vault where all your eggs are kept, at the start of a month, a group of eggs is sent out of the vault. The number of eggs you have available is dependent upon your age, and your ovarian reserve, such as your AMH or your follicle count. When we do IVF, all we can do is get those eggs to grow. So I can't tap into the vault. I can't get more eggs. I'm trying to stimulate and grow the ones that you have available. So it's going to be very important to understand what that number is as it changes your protocol, your expectations, how many cycles you may have to do. When you go through the process, your body doesn't want to have that entire group of eggs growing. So if we use an average 30-year-old, an average 30-year-old might have around 20 eggs available outside the vault, and you don't want to have 20 babies at one time. So we're really trying to override the normal brain to ovary communication system in order to get this to happen. If we remember that normal ovulation, you have a bunch of eggs outside the vault, each egg grows in a follicle, the brain sends out FSH or follicle stimulating hormone well-named hormone that gets one egg to grow. As that egg is growing, it's making estrogen. It's talking back to the brain so that you get to this one follicle. That's the one that'll ovulate. Everybody else dies. In order to overwrite this, I like to think about the IVF protocol as suppression and stimulation. You are naturally suppressed at the start of your cycle. And so occasionally going and just starting at the right time can be an option but I find we usually get less than optimal results. So that might be a good approach if you have a really high egg count, but that's not the best approach or protocol for most people. And the way that I like to explain this protocol situation is that if we imagine a nest of baby birds and normal, a normal month is mommy bird brings in one worm, the biggest bird gets the worm and fulfills the prophecy to become the biggest bird. If I starve all of the birds for a short amount of time, and now none of the birds have any worms, they are all hungry, they're all small, the same size, nobody's the big bird, and their little beaks are all open. If I then come in and dump a bucket of worms into the nest every single day, now we are getting this entire group of birds to grow together at the same pace. So imagine the difference in trying to get just one egg to grow with ovulation, that's biggest bird gets the worm, and trying to get all of the birds to grow together. And we can override that by a little bit of trickery by starving them and then giving more than enough worms for everybody. So when we do IVF, I like to describe the protocol, the combination of medications that we need as suppression and then stimulation. Suppression is anything that modifies FSH. So this can be estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, birth control pills, ovulation blockers, or medications that work directly at the brain. These you will need to start at different times of your cycle, and they last usually about two to four weeks, depending on the protocol. Then stimulation is about two weeks of hormone shots, mostly FSH. So FSH is the food, it's the driver of egg growth. So most of your protocol is going to be FSH. Now, during that process, you're going to be coming in for monitoring, typically every two to three days, depending on your protocol, for an ultrasound, maybe blood work, and then medications will be changed, decisions will be made, and then at the end of this, you'll have an egg retrieval. The egg retrieval is where we go in, hopefully under anesthesia, get the eggs out of the body, and then egg and sperm can be fertilized in the lab, and embryos can grow out. Embryos can then be frozen, sent off for genetic testing, and we can line up for what's called an FET or frozen embryo transfer. 
You can also do a fresh transfer in the context of an IVF cycle, meaning the embryo that looks the best five days after fertilization, take it and put it in the body. However, we see a lot of data that we have increase in pregnancy complications and a decrease in pregnancy success, as well as an increase in risks like ovarian hyperstimulation. So there are a few scenarios where that would apply. Typically, if we are young and don't need genetic testing and we don't have many eggs, you might be a candidate. But often, at least in my experience, many of my patients are trying to save embryos for the future. So the genetic testing is a really, really valuable piece of information. But if we think about it, IVF in vitro fertilization, fertilization in the lab, that is putting egg and sperm together in the lab. These embryos can often be frozen. And then we line up for the FET or the frozen embryo transfer. And there's different protocols that can happen at that time. You can do what's considered a medicated cycle, give you estrogen. You can do that with Lupron, which is a suppressant medication, which is definitely my preference for endometriosis or adenomyosis. You can also do a natural or a modified natural cycle where your body grows the lining from an ovulatory follicle. When we have a genetically normal embryo, just because that's the most finite data we can get, we expect from one embryo transfer, a live birth rate of around 65 to 70. After two cumulative embryo transfers, not the same time, but one than the other, 88% chance of success. And after three, it's 95%. So the rate limiting set for most people is having enough genetically normal embryos. And that's because not every egg is going to be mature, will fertilize, grow to an embryo, be genetically normal, or result in a successful pregnancy. Typically, of the eggs that we get, we see fertilization of about 75 to 80% of the mature. About half of them will typically grow through to a blastocyst. And then the percentage normal will be based on your age. If you're in your early 30s, it'll be about 50%. And of course, these numbers are average, which means some people do better, some people do worse. So this is just a good example. If you have 20 eggs that are mature, yay, 16 would fertilize, eight would grow out, four might be genetically normal. If you want to have three kids, that's probably not enough embryos. And you would need to go do another cycle call it embryo banking, where I go get next month's group of eggs in order to have more embryos to grow my family. So understanding what the basic IVF process is, is very important. And I do have a whole playlist and lots of videos on it. But what questions should you be asking as you're doing the process? Number one, what is my expected egg count? And obviously you have month to month variation. Just because we measure 20 antral follicles, we might not get 20 to grow but it's a good expected average. So what is my expected egg count if everything goes perfectly? You should know that number. Number two, based on my family goals, which means you have to tell your doctor your goals, how many kids you want to add to your family, do you anticipate I will need more than one cycle if everything falls average? And you can run the math equation and they can give you an example. So if you say, hey, I really, my perfect family has three kids. Do you think I will probably have to do more than one cycle so I can mentally be prepared? You should know what, if everything's average, everything looks good, what road you're running, what race you're running. So number two, based on my goals, how many egg retrieval do you anticipate I will need? Number three, why did you choose this protocol for me? It doesn't matter the specifics of the protocol for this video. We'll do another more detailed one. But what you really want is that somebody is personally picking a protocol for some reason for you and not, this is the protocol that we always do. That is not going to be a satisfactory answer. If they say, this is the protocol we like to do for patients with PCOS or endometriosis or a low AMH, those are more appropriate. They are picking a protocol based on your personal situation. Number four, who does the monitoring? Do I get a calendar ahead of time? How long will I be there? Do I need to come to two places or one? So a good example is there is an IVF clinic here in town and you will do your ultrasound at the clinic and then they send you to an outside lab and you sit there and wait to get your blood drawn. That's just going to take more time of your day. We will draw your blood and do your ultrasound at once and that's a lot more efficient. So you know you're only carving out 20 minutes of your day, not hours of your day. And when you're coming in every two to three days, that really matters. Also, a calendar ahead of time. Obviously, things might change. You want the flexibility if you need to be seen more or less to change. But do you not know your next appointment until you come in? Or do you get to at least have a structure or a game plan? 
I think that's really, really important. And then who's doing the monitoring? Is it a doctor? Is it a nurse? Is it an ultrasound tech? Who's going to be doing it? You want to know who you're going to be interfacing with. We have physician only monitoring. So you'll see myself or my partner. And the thing I like about it is that you get immediate feedback. Hey, I see this many. This is what we would expect. Probably the game plan will be X, Y, Z. We'll follow up when your blood work comes back. If you have an ultrasound tech, obviously they're not going to give you more information and that's okay, but how are you going to get that information? So what is that interaction going to be like? Number five, how will I get instructions throughout the cycle? Who is going to communicate with me and how? Is it going to be a nurse, your doctor? Is it going to be a phone call, an email, a portal message? Make sure you just know what the communication style will be and that that fits into your life. If it is a phone call and you don't answer the phone, that's going to be a little rough. So make sure you know, and you can make changes. And then number six for me is what are we going to do after we have the embryos? How do we know what the next steps are? Do we have a follow-up visit? Are you going to send me a message? How do I know if I've achieved the goal and how am I going to get information about my next steps? Too often I see patients lost in the in-between where they have their embryos and they're just waiting to find out what next and the clinic doesn't reach out, the clinic's waiting for you to reach out, and you're just caught in between. Nobody wants to waste more time, so just have a game plan. Go in for your egg retrieval. How am I gonna get these results? How are we gonna find out how many made it through and got sent off? And then how am I gonna get my next plan? So know what to expect, and that's gonna make the process a lot easier. Last thing I would say is, how are you gonna ask questions? If something comes up, is it your nurse? Is it you're just going to call the line and wait? Is there a direct line to your doctor? How are you going to be able to ask questions along the way? Because you can't advocate for yourself if you can't get in touch with anybody. IVF can feel overwhelming, but truly it's an amazing tool that helps so many people have families. The best thing you can do is understand the process and know how to be your own advocate. Feel free to ask questions below so we can do an IVF follow-up video. And then also follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. And you can check out the As A Woman podcast. Please subscribe and share so that we can get more health information to more people. Thanks, friends.